So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, at the Future Law Virtual Summit. It's my absolute pleasure today to introduce today's keynote speaker in this fireside chat format, Professor Payam Achavon. Uh, Professor Achavon holds several positions, including being a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, a senior fellow at Massey College, and distinguished visitor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. Professor Achavon has also held full professorship at McGill University Faculty of Law and previous appointments at Yale, Oxford, Paris Nantia, European University Institute and Leiden Universities. He's also published extensively and served with the United Nations in Bosnia, Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda and Timor-Leste. He has served as counsel before the European Court of Human Rights, the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Payam as he takes us through the topic of judicial enforcement of human rights as the new global ethos. We will have 15 minutes of presentation followed by some questions in a fireside uh, format. Dear Payam, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this, for this uh, kind invitation and thank you to all the friends and colleagues that have joined this fireside chat. Um, I thought I would share with you today some reflections on uh, the judicial enforcement of human rights as a new global ethos and to perhaps uh, share with you uh, some uh, thoughts and images as well from um, a recent case uh, in which I had the privilege of uh, acting as counsel, the genocide convention case um, initiated by the Gambia against Myanmar that some of you may be aware of, which I think is a uh, remarkable uh, contemporary example of the phenomena that I wish to speak about. Now, as students of international law, we uh, know about the seismic shift um, upon the adoption of the UN Charter um, in the ashes of the Second World War, the seismic shift from state-centric to human-centric conceptions of international law. The notion of crimes against humanity, which was adopted in the uh, Charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, um, the uh, Genocide Convention, uh, which was adopted on 9 December 1948, just one day before the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, were truly revolutionary developments in the sense that they moved the international legal order away from um, a set of self-contained sovereign entities uh, towards some semblance of universality. So human rights in effect became the core global ethos um, in the post second world war order. And we know of course that subsequently there were numerous international human rights treaties, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of 1966. The year prior to that in 1965, the International Convention on the Elimination of all, all Forms of Racial Discrimination. And of course, in addition to that, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And one could go on and on to really speak about a proliferation of human rights treaties. Uh, and of course, in addition to the human rights treaties, we have that other branch known as humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, uh, which regulates um, the humane treatment of uh, non-combatants in armed conflict, uh, the additional protocols of 1977. Um, and of course, in an area which straddles both human rights law and international criminal law, which in effect is the imposition of criminal responsibility for certain human rights violations. We have the uh, 1984 Convention Against Torture. Uh, and one can say um, that for the most part, we don't uh, face a situation uh, where there is any um, significant gap in terms of the sort of norms that we would want um, as, if you like, a basic constitution of the global order. The problem, of course, is always enforcement. States are more than happy to sign on to treaties 
which of course is a means by which they legitimize themselves uh, in an international community in which the discourse of human rights has become a measure of legitimacy. But they are far more reluctant to accept any international jurisdiction that could scrutinize their conduct. So the sort of obvious fact is that uh, 75 years after the adoption of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is still no UN Human Rights Court. Uh, in, instead, we have a group of disparate and quite weak implementation mechanisms. Some of them are treaty-based mechanisms that simply uh, review uh, 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 periodic reports. Some of them can receive individual petitions and uh, issue their observations. Uh, but none really operates as a court of law, uh, and certainly there is no entity which has the imprimatur that, for example, we would give to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And then we are left with the UN Human Rights Council and other political bodies which are uh, necessarily uh, selective and politicized in how they address human rights issues. So bearing that in mind, um, at the international level, we have really two primary mechanisms to address these issues. One is the International Criminal Court. The other is the International Court of Justice. The International Criminal Court, as I will shortly explain, of course, um, is not only starved of resources and still marginalized um, in the face of uh, the power realities of global politics, but it doesn't have jurisdiction in respect of states that have not signed its statute, that have not ratified its statute, unless the UN Security Council makes a referral, as it did on two occasions in respect of Sudan in 2005 and Libya in 2011. Um, but the Security Council is necessarily selective because it is a political uh, body. So, for example, efforts to refer Syria were blocked by uh, vetoes of permanent members, notably the Russian Federation. So then we have the International Court of Justice, which of course can render advisory opinions that are requested by organs such as the General Assembly, which are non-binding. Um, but the contentious jurisdiction where the court can actually issue binding decisions is reserved only to states. So only states have standing to bring cases before the court. Unlike the ICC, where um, notwithstanding the fact that states can make referrals or the Security Council can make referrals, the prosecutor herself can also initiate investigations where the court has jurisdiction. Not so in the ICJ, where a state has to uh, bring uh, uh, proceedings. And in that respect, um, one has to deal inevitably with the fact that where states do not have direct interests, where their citizens are not being harmed, um, what motivations do they have to initiate a human rights case in the name of a global ethos, in the name of universal human rights, um, to stand in solidarity with victims halfway across the world uh, with whom they have no particular relation or interest except uh, in moral terms. So now I turn to the case of Myanmar and uh, the uh, long persecuted Rohingya minority, which some of you may be aware of. The Rohingya are a uh, Muslim minority uh, concentrated in Rakhine state in Myanmar. They have long faced a campaign of persecution and I will now in the few minutes that I have, share with you um, some images uh, and explain perhaps the story of this remarkable experiment where now both the ICC and the ICJ, each in their own way, are addressing the uh, 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 ethnic cleansing, the atrocities being committed uh, against the Rohingya. And this is quite a remarkable experiment, um, you might say, in how uh, one can instrumentalize international courts and tribunals um, in order to speak truth to power where one has uh, very few other options. So with your permission, I will now um, begin 
this slide show, if you bear with me. Can you all see the, yeah, very good. So the image that you see was taken in uh, September of 2017 on the border of Bangladesh, looking towards Myanmar. And what you see in the background are Rohingya villages being burnt in what was known as so-called clearance operations. Uh, and during these so-called clearance operations, some 400 Rohingya villages were burnt uh, and um, there was a, a very clear and unmistakable pattern of uh, the mass uh, murder uh, uh, and uh, uh, horrific uh, sexual violence uh, against uh, civilians, uh, merely on the ground that they were a Rohingya, and these crimes were perpetrated by members of the Myanmar uh, military forces known as the Tatmadaw. So this uh, resulted in a mass exodus of some 1 million Rohingya refugees into neighboring Bangladesh. Uh, here is one image of the um, desperate uh, but fortunate survivors. Actually, the fact that they survived was quite remarkable in itself. Um, navigating or uh, negotiating their way across the barbed wire fence that divided the boundary to seek a refuge in Bangladesh. And today, the biggest refugee camp in the world is Kutupalong in Bangladesh. And in total, there are about 1 million uh, Rohingya uh, refugees. Um, here are other images of that uh, mass uh, exodus of um, uh, desperate uh, people fleeing uh, for their lives. And I had occasion um, some months later to uh, visit the camps. Here is a, a girl, and you may have seen this image. It's taken by my friend Yusuf Tushar, an award-winning photographer from Bangladesh. And this girl, like many other children, witnessed her parents uh, murdered uh, in, in front of her. And it was truly unspeakable to hear the testimony of the witnesses. And to call these crimes unspeakable would be an understatement. Um, infants being... Um, thrown into fires to burn in the eyes of their parents. And the, the cruelty is truly, truly uh, unspeakable. And of course, it renders empty the vow of never again, going back to 1948 and the Genocide Convention, never again will we allow this uh, heinous crime to be committed. But sadly, time and again, we have seen in Srebrenica and Rwanda and Darfur and now in Myanmar, that the international community doesn't have the will to confront this uh, ultimate crime. When I was uh, at the camps, um, I met uh, the members of the Bangladesh border guards. And I share this image because to me, they, are, they were truly heroic in how they helped this mass exodus of refugees. Of course, we're used to seeing soldiers as killers, but these soldiers became humanitarian workers. And they helped um, these desperate refugees come into Bangladesh. And even the local uh, uh, inhabitants of this district called Cox's Bazaar, who have um, very little to share. They are people who uh, you know, are uh, uh, poor farmers. But the way in which they welcomed the refugees, the way in which they shared their own food with them, I think um, is a great lesson for all of us, especially at this time of uh, xenophobia and anti-immigrant uh, sentiment and populist hatred in our affluent Western countries to see how these people who had so little uh, to share were in fact so generous. And of course, the soldiers also were witnesses, witnesses to the testimony uh, of the um, uh, refugees. And as I showed you in the very first image, you could actually see the scene of the crime from the Bangladesh border. So it was just a matter of kilometers where these crimes were being committed. Here, I met with a group of women, as, and as you can see, they are uh, traditional uh, 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 Muslims. They come from small uh, villages. Uh, and 
uh, some of the stories that these women shared with me, which is not really adequately conveyed in that uh, image with the beautiful child there, uh, but the crimes of sexual violence were truly, truly horrific. It took me uh, many days to recover from simply what I'd heard. And I can only imagine um, the suffering which they have to deal with uh, every day. So when I left the camp, of course, you're shattered as any human being would be. Uh, you're, 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 you're full of grief and you're full of rage that um, such injustice can be committed. And our instinct is to want justice. And of course, I'm a law professor. We talk about justice and all sorts of theoretical constructs. But I can tell you that there is nothing like um, human suffering to teach us the meaning of justice in a culture which intellectualizes everything. We have to understand that the beginning and end of everything is empathy. Until you feel the suffering of others, you will never understand the significance of uh, justice. So when I was leaving in that uh, gloom, that darkness that had surrounded me, I saw this image in a camp of someone who had made this Ferris wheel out of uh, wood from the neighboring forests so that these traumatized children could have some place where they could go and uh, uh, for a moment forget their pain and forget their suffering. And that was an image of hope, which was the beginning of a journey to search for how we could use existing international courts and tribunals with all their limitations in order to bring at least some measure of justice to these people. So the International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction in respect of Myanmar because Myanmar is not a state party. And predictably, states that commit atrocities do not accept the court's jurisdiction because to do so would be to subject their own political and military leaders to prosecution. But Bangladesh was and is a state party to the ICC. And the theory was devised that in respect to the crime against humanity of deportation, the crime is initiated on the territory of Myanmar, but completed on the territory of Bangladesh upon the crossing of the international boundary. And in fact, that is what the crime of deportation is, forced displacement across an international boundary. And we persuaded the International Criminal Court that it could exercise jurisdiction in respect of the crime of deportation on that basis. And the court upheld that submission. And today there is an investigation uh, in respect of crime, the crime against humanity of deportation. But of course, that left unaddressed, if you like, the elephant in the room, which is the crime of genocide, uh, which is committed on the territory of Myanmar. And the only basis for the jurisdiction, for a, for a, a sort of uh, international court exercise jurisdiction, was Article 9 of the 1948 Genocide Convention, which allowed states parties to bring disputes regarding the Genocide Convention to the International Court of Justice. But we needed to find a plaintiff, a state that was willing to initiate this case. And there we fall into the problem of politics, which state would have the interest or the willingness, even if it had no immediate geopolitical interest, even if there was no uh, oil or precious minerals or strategic interests, to bring such a case in the name of humanity. And it, it was in that remarkable search that we found our unlikely hero uh, in the person of the small African nation of the Gambia, with a population of 2 million in West Africa, whose Minister of Justice at the time, Abu Bakr Tambadu, had at a meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation visited the refugee camps and been so moved by what he saw in those camps that he persuaded his government to bring this historic case before the International Court of Justice. 
So now in the min few minutes that remain, I will quickly speak about that case. On 11 November 2019, the Gambia filed its application against Myanmar, which was a state party to the Genocide Convention, um, and uh, requested uh, urgent, uh, an urgent hearing on provisional measures. And as we were preparing for that urgent hearing, which was scheduled just for one month later on uh, December 10, 19, uh, uh, 2019, incidentally, that was Human Rights Day, it was the anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We thought that it would be unthinkable to have this hearing without some of those refugees being in the room with us. So through a, a remarkable story, which I don't have time to share, we managed within a very short span of 48 hours to have three of the refugees who had never left their country except to become refugees in Bangladesh, who had no travel documents which needed to be issued, who had never been on an airplane to fly to The Hague to attend the hearing. And I can tell you that they flew on Emirates, which is not a bad airline to fly if you've never been on an aircraft. So here are our three friends. You see here Yusuf and Hasin, ha Hamida and Hasina, who, as you can see from the expression on their faces, had uh, suffered and witnessed uh, horrific crimes. And you can see here that, in a sense, they're terrified. They have no idea what to expect. Uh, being in an airplane, going to a country halfway across the world they may never have heard about, and then above all, to go into this intimidating peace palace in The Hague, where these judges would sit and where the state councillor of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, would also be present. So on the day before the hearing, we took this photograph together in the council room just before going into the court to uh, plead this case. And you can once again see the expressions on their face and the tremendous anxiety that they had. Now, um, I mention this because the effect which this proceeding had on these survivors speaks volumes about the power of justice, the power and meaning of justice. So here in the courtroom, you see Hamida sitting with her translator. And there is this famous image taken by the Reuters photographers of captured Rohingya men who are about to be uh, executed. And you can see the judges in front of the room. And the next image, of course, is when these uh, captives are executed. And you see the devastating impact of the survivors reliving these traumas in the courtroom. Here in the front, you even see one of the judges who's moved by this image of human suffering. And one of the challenges, of course, is how do you bring to life the reality of that injustice and suffering before a court halfway across the world, a court with rarefied proceedings among distinguished judges and learned advocates and professors and, and, and what have you. Now, here we have a, a, an image of the agent of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, the uh, Nobel Prize uh, laureate who was defending Myanmar uh, in the proceedings. And here you have the image of Gambia's Minister of Justice, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr Tambadu, who was the agent of the Gambia. And one of the questions one has to ask is, well, what does the Gambia have to do bringing a case against Myanmar? They're you know, halfway across the world. And that's exactly the power of this case because it was purely a matter of conscience. It was purely a matter of someone has to speak truth to power. Someone has to stand in solidarity with these survivors. So this small African nation was transformed into a moral giant by initiating this case. Now here you see the uh, court. Uh, this is the, um, the Myanmar bench. Once again, you see the agent, Aung San Suu Kyi and, and the council. And you can just imagine how intimidating it would be for these three refugees to be sitting in that room. 
And here are some other uh, images of the pleadings before the court and our attempts to bring to life through pleadings and the testimony of the survivors the woes and tribulations that they suffer. Now, I show this because the next image, I think, is a beautiful image. Back at the hotel, we're sitting here with the transformed faces <laughs> of our friends who are in total disbelief, total disbelief that the entire world, including the agent of Myanmar, uh, had to sit and listen to the stories of the incredible crimes that were committed against them. And this image, even as a law professor who teaches all sorts of theoretical constructs, it's moments like this when we begin to understand the deeper meaning of justice and why it doesn't matter if you're fighting against overwhelming odds, or in fact, it is exactly when you have overwhelming odds that you have to persist and do whatever you can in order to achieve whatever measure of justice is possible. Here is an image of our uh, legal team. Um, and uh, you see here that our friends from the camps are part of our uh, delegation. And that really motivated us to fight even harder for this case. Um, here you have another image of the Rohingya in front of the uh, Peace Palace. And you can once again imagine how intimidating it would have been for them to come from those from the squalor of the refugee camps to this majestic building and uh, to sit there in the audience. Now, just to wrap up, on January 23rd, 2020, the court rendered a unanimous judgment, 17 votes to zero, there were 17 judges, in respect of provisional measures, in respect of protective measures, calling upon Myanmar to take all measures within its power to prevent acts of genocide. And of course, while the case is not yet finished and there is a long way to go. We will be filing our main submission uh, on October uh, 23rd, actually, just uh, in a few days. But this um, initial judgment gave these survivors uh, a measure of hope which they once could not have imagined. So I will end with that image of the reaction in the refugee camps because our, our three friends had gone back to the refugee camps after the hearing and I asked them, please send me a photo of yourself once you hear the judgment. So here is that photo and the smiles on their faces speak a thousand words <laughs> um, about the power of simply having your suffering, the injustice that has been inflicted upon you, recognized, vindicated, and validated. So um, I end uh, on that note and just return to the theme of judicial enforcement of human rights as the new global ethos. Uh, it's very easy to be cynical, to basically say that uh, speaking truth to power doesn't matter. The world is all about power politics and uh, money and narcissism and, and, and you know, what, what have you. Um, but we live in an interdependent world, inextricably interdependent global village. Uh, and we should never underestimate the uh, power of uh, legitimacy. So I thank you once again for the invitation and I will um, uh, leave myself available for a few minutes if there are any uh, questions. Certainly. Thank you so much, Payam, uh, for that. And um, wow, very moving photos, very moving story. Um, if we, we, we would have benefited, I think, from, from having a longer session to take time to digest this, and I can only imagine what the process would have been having been there directly as well. Um, 
I guess there's a few questions that that I wanted to 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 place here. Um, hopefully that that um, is uh, appropriate. But but I'll, I'll let I'll let us dance with this idea. Um, if I understand correctly, this particular situation is unprecedented. Is this the first time perhaps that we've ever seen that another nation state has represented on behalf of another nation state for crimes against humanity? In respect of the genocide convention, yes. Uh, okay. There was a prior case, uh, one brought by Bosnia against Serbia and yes. one by Croatia against Serbia, but those were cases in which the, 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 the applicant states were directly affected. Okay. Uh, but there was one precedent in 1966 when Liberia and, South, and, and Ethiopia brought a case against South Africa in mm. respect of the uh, 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 administration of what was then South Africa, Southwest Africa, which is today Namibia. And um, that um, case was rejected by the court based on really a purely procedural ground that Right. Those states did not have standing to, to bring a case. And the shadow of that case actually uh, was hanging over this case. But fortunately, the court decided otherwise on this occasion. Okay. So in the context of that, thank you so much for clarifying. In the context of that, um, it, it could be suggested that perhaps the, the international law is evolving in its character uh, besides perhaps procedural or framework wise, but definitely in its character in terms of what judges are willing to admit now, willing to, um, to accept in, in the interest of human rights. If it could be, if international law could be evolved or revolutionized, what, what do you feel would its future capability look like? Um, what would be its purpose? I'm sorry, you cut up for just one minute. Uh, just I apologize. that, that, that right. part, yeah. The question was, if international law could be could evolve or be revolutionized, what would yes, its yes, okay. capability look like or what would its purpose be in your eyes? Well, I mean, one of the uh, uh, ideals, of course, would be, first of all, to have an international criminal court with universal jurisdiction. Right. An international criminal court that would have jurisdiction over uh, any uh, crimes against humanity committed anywhere in the world. But we have a consent-based system um, where uh, states are sovereign, and unless states consent to jurisdiction, international courts have no jurisdiction. Um, and then in respect of the International Court of Justice, it's the same thing, that there right. would be uh, a court that in respect of state responsibility, as opposed to individual criminal responsibility, right. would have jurisdiction over any dispute between uh, any uh, countries in the world. So that is certainly, from the point of view of enforcement, yes. uh, the ideal. And one possibility would be also to have a UN Human Rights Court, um, which um, uh, you know, would maybe be a specialized regime because the International Court of Justice may deal with other issues, such as mm -hmm. uh, boundary disputes between states, questions of sovereign immunity, and, and, and what right. have you. Um, and of course, the big question is standing. Do victims have the standing to bring a case in their own name? And, and that's the difference between a human rights court and yes. the International Court of Justice. The International Court yes. of Justice is for interstate disputes. Yes. This makes this uh, fascinating in terms of uh, parallels that can be drawn, for instance, to intellectual property law. Um, it's a similar situation. Standing is always the key in then the whole dichotomy that you've painted, which is why would a uh, nation that is potentially committing these acts uh, elect to prosecute themselves? But it leads to another question that, that um, is sort of linked very closely to this, and perhaps the final question um, that's linked closely to this uh, event. Um, so much of the change that we see can, in fact, the, the purpose of this event, negotiating the new normal, is about system change um, really from the bottom up. So for me, it's interesting to see uh, as you're playing in the international arena, what you feel the connection is between and the flow is between grassroots action and this international arena that you've just been playing in. That's a oh. very good question. And, and I think that first of all, I mean, the grassroots can mean many things. Here, yes. well, the victims first and foremost are the grassroots, uh, the survivors. Right. 
Right. Um, and they, it is their injustice perpetrated against them that is, in a sense, the beginning uh, uh, of the story. Uh, mm. But then I would say that in having worked on this file over the past three years and on mm. other cases before, you come across humanitarian workers in the camps, you come across journalists, diplomats, scholars, mm human rights activists, and you begin to see uh, what remarkable people there are out there in the world. It really gives you hope. <laughs> people who care, who care yes. about human suffering rather than being indifferent, yes. uh, and who bear witness, who begin to speak out. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was famously said that you know, the, the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers. It began with words. Yes. And we forget about the power of words, certainly in this case, hateful words, which mm -hmm. dehumanize others and justify atrocities against them. But we mm -hmm. should also understand the power of truth, the power of saying the, the, the right word, saying this is unacceptable, this is not right, we cannot remain silent. And we have the famous saying that all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. So that's one thing that we, it's, it's too easy to be cynical. It's too easy to be depressed about the condition of the world. It takes no effort. So we have to uh, do what we can. We have to fight. We have to struggle. We have to have faith. But the beginning of that journey is empathy. The beginning of that journey is feeling the pain of the suffering of others and deciding that we are going to be part of the solution. Right. So that's where the grassroots come in. And Perfect. I think even elite institutions, the International Court of Justice, the United Nations, and what have you, um, ultimately, they cannot remain indifferent to mass mobilization. Right. And that's precise, uh, fantastic uh, point to make there. Um, I'm thinking um, uh, this is obviously a, a forum that's been open to uh, lawyers and um, people from uh, system thinkers and other types of individuals alike, though it has been led by by a, by two uh, passionate lawyers and a team around them, um, yourself being a lawyer, myself being a lawyer, I think the only extension that I'm that I'm asking also then perhaps or or assuming now is that for lawyers uh, who perhaps are not playing in the international arena, what 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 does that look? What could that look like for them um, in terms of mobilization at a grassroots level? Um, and 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 it's and, and it seems it, it it seems like a I would assume that's a very tough question to unpack because there are many things that could be done. But if there's anything that you could suggest, even for perhaps some of the listeners who who are, who are legally trained in who are, who are not necessarily working at an um, international arena, what they may be doing uh, from from their um, from their grassroots as well. Yes, I think that's a very good question. As we wrap up our our discussion, I think. Um, you know, we have this uh, false dichotomy between the global and the local. Mm. And it may be very glamorous to think about The Hague and the International Court of Justice, but to me, it makes no difference mm. uh, which arena uh, uh, we struggle in. The point is that we uh, struggle and we do what we can. Um, and uh, to me, um, uh, you know, fighting for the rights of your next door neighbor is no different than fighting for the rights of someone halfway across the world. And I would say that empathy is a continuum. Um, and uh, it begins with how we um, relate to our next door neighbor and then uh, uh, in a sense reflects itself more widely uh, globally. Uh, and you see time and again that um, human rights violations, corruptions and the extreme cases genocide happen because people allow it to happen. We give power to leaders that lead us down the path to hell and destruction. So I think that as practitioners, um, we have certain skills. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we uh, know how to utilize the law, mm -hmm. which is just a tool in the toolbox. Um, the question is, what makes us decide how to use those tools, whether it's uh, I don't know, to uh, help a, uh, a, a vulnerable person whose landlord is kicking them out of their apartment in the middle of the winter, rendering them homeless, or uh, prosecuting a case 
dealing with crimes against humanity. All of them are a, a reflection of how we choose to use uh, our skills, our privilege, our um, platform uh, yes. in order to, to do good. Fantastic. Thank you, Payam John. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I understand you are in the middle of the case. Now you're, you're on site. And as you mentioned, on the 23rd, you'll be pursuing the, 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 uh, the entire case in its entirety. Or, or it's another case. It's another case. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you so much for, for bringing um, awareness to this and for all of your insight in relation to this. Thank you. Thank you so, so thank very much. You. Thank you for the invitation and for this great initiative. Thank you.